When we think about the migration crisis, I imagine most of us are probably thinking about this line here, which is Greece, right? The migration crisis was in 2015. It was an event that happened at one year, one particular point in time, and then flows heavily decreased. But this is not at all the case for Italy. And it's really important to recognize that Italy has had a very different experience than Greece and a very different crisis situation than Greece. Italy has had extremely high flows since 2014 that were consistent and only started to drop off at the second half of 2017. Um, and in 2018, they significantly decreased due to the Libya and Italy deal. But prior to this, they had very high flows for basically four years. If, if you compare, I don't have it here on the graph, but from 2013 to 2014, flows increased by 400% in Italy. So a very high increase in flows. And the result of this was that in 2014, through Italy declared you know, a state of emergency for the asylum seeker crisis. And basically from 2014 to 2017, for over this three and a half year period, the asylum and reception system was operating in a state of emergency and a state of crisis. So my field work began on the ground in January 2017, and this was still the oper operational position that was going on in Italy at that point in time. Um, but then at the same time, there are a tremendous amount of structural and policy changes through this time. And that's why the role of multi-level governance is really important and what we'll look at first in trying to understand the situation in Italy. So um, flipping to the other side of the story today is Eritreans. So it's a two-part story about the multi-level governance in Italy and then the story about the Eritrean migrants. Um, this is just a map to show you of Eritrea and I just want to give a bit of a background about who Eritreans are and why they're migrating. Um, Eritrea is a very small country. It has a population of only 5.2 million. In these three and a half year, four year period from 2014 to 2017, over 100,000 Eritreans came to Italy alone. That is almost 2% of the country's population, so a really high number. 2016 was declared the Eritrean exodus by analysts because so many Eritreans were fleeing the country. Um, for those of you who don't know, Eritrea has had a, a state-run society that is very strong. There is forced conscription. There is endemic poverty. So people have been fleeing the country for a very long time, since around 2000. Mostly they flee first to Ethiopia and to Sudan, but due to poor conditions there, they seek to migrate onwards. What happens to them? Um, in their migration, so you can more or less see the route here, it's this eastern route through Africa, is that they'll then come into Libya. And in Libya, they enter in the southeast here, which is a part of Libya that since the fall of Gaddafi has been controlled by the Tibu tribe. And why this is important is because with the fall of Gaddafi, I mean, there's no central government in Libya anymore, and different regional tribes manage different parts of the country, basically. It basically has sort of paramilitary states. And in this part, in the southeast, the Tipu have gained a very strong control, and a key part of the income for them is through kidnapping and extortion. So systematically, um, what happens to your trans is they hire a smuggler in Khartoum. The smuggler says, okay, I will leave you at the border, and then they will come for you. And it's known that you wait there, and the Libyans will come for you and take you. Um, sometimes you have to wait a few hours. Sometimes it's days or even a week. People will walk back to a town in Sudan to get water and food and then come back, and they wait. When they wait, they're brought in um, to basically prisons. Uh, they're told the amount that they have to pay, they have to get those funds from their family, and they have to make the payment. So this is not a situation of human smuggling because there's no prearranged contract that is made with a smuggler. You have to wait until the kidnappers kidnap you, you have to wait until they're in their possession, and then you have to pay the amount that they tell you. And that can range. Sometimes it's 2,000 US dollars, sometimes it's 6,000 US dollars. Um, I don't know why there's differences in numbers, but there are differences in numbers. Only once your family has made that payment will you be released and you're sent north where you're given to another tribe and you're pushed to the sea. So this is the situation. Um, and your trans know this, they're aware of this, and they often prepare for this as they make their movements. Once they cross into Italy, what happens is that they um, are generally, their boats are generally rescued by rescue ships, and the rescue ships then take them to the hotspots. 
So the hotspots are part of the um, EU's new approach to migration, that the EU agenda on migration that was implemented in 2015. In 2015, the first, late 2015, the first hotspot was opened in Italy. As of now, there are five hotspots in Italy. And the hotspots are um, implemented for a core reason that in 2014, the majority of arrivals to Italy transited through Italy. And the reason that they were able to do this is because the Italian officials frequently did not fingerprint them at arrival. And the Italian officials said, we've had a 400% increase in migrants. Our concern is their health, their safety, and providing them food and shelter. It is not to fingerprint them. And because of this, um, an entire infrastructure developed across the country as being a transit country. So this literally meant that you could go in Rome to NGOs and they would give you your transit backward for going onwards into northern countries in the EU. Um, in Milan, a center was opened called The Hub, where you could receive um, shelter for the night, you could receive food, water, whatever you need. They would ask you what you wanted to do, and if you wanted to go onwards, okay, no problem. They assisted you in what ways they, they could. So Italy was very much a transit country at that point in time. Well, as I'm sure, I mean, as we all know, and as I'm sure we can imagine, Northern European countries were not very um, enthusiastic about this. And Italy was not doing its job of fingerprinting, so they could not return people via the Dublin arrangements. So we had the implementation of the hotspots. And what are the hotspots? They are, um, oh, sorry, they are um, centers that are run between uh, a joint arrangement of EU organizations, so with different representation from different groups. And their main role is to manage disembarkation procedures. So at disembarkation, people are fingerprinted and they are sorted into what type of migrant they are. This was a really big issue in Italy because in Italy they do not believe in forcing people to be fingerprinted, but now if you don't, you're not fingerprinted, you're not allowed to leave the hotspot. So there's a lot of debate as to if this is, or is not a violation of your human rights. There was a lot of protest with Eritreans burning their fingers so they could not be fingerprinted. So there's been a lot of contestation around this. Um, and then what happens when you're at the hotspots is you're supposed to be sorted into the type of migrant you are and allocated to a certain stream that you're going into. So for instance, if you're supposed to be going for relocation, you're supposed to be sent here. If you, they thought that, well, you don't have a very good chance in your um, asylum claim, then you're sent here. So it's also meant as a point for sorting people. There have been criticisms from many academics that these are sites where human rights violations are occurring, people are deported immediately from hotspots before even having the chance to make an asylum claim. So there's been a lot of um, different discussions about it. But what's important is that um, from 2014, we're only th around 30% of new arrivals were fingerprinted. By 2018, over 95% of new arrivals were fingerprinted. So the hotspots had strongly delivered in their first goal, which was to ensure fingerprinting and processing. The second policy that the EU implemented um, to sort of soften the deal of the hotspots was the idea of relocation. Relocation was one of the first and central um, policies implemented by the EU for solidarity and responsibility sharing. And the idea is, of course, that to take nationalities who had applications with over for international protection with over a 75% success rate to be relocated to no other countries within the EU and away from the frontline states of Greece and Italy. Um, in total, in 2016, there was 160,000 places were pledged, but at the, when the program ended in 2018, there was only um, a little over 12,000 people relocated from Italy. So the relocation program has been heavily criticized, we'll talk about that a bit in the conclusion, but it was also centrally important. In Italy, Eritreans were the main uh, nationality eligible for the relocation program. So um, the next element about this that is really important is how does reception in Italy work and what happens in terms of relocation upon arrival in Italy. So in Italy, what happens if you want to apply for asylum, you have to go to the local police station, which is called the local prefetura office, and make a claim for asylum. So again, I want to really stress here that this is not at all like the situation in the Netherlands where we have a central body that is in charge of processing asylum claims and that is their goal. You have to go to the police office, right? So it's, it's a big difference. Um, 
Initially, what was supposed to happen if you wanted relocation and if you were Eritrean was that arrival, you were supposed to go initially to one center. And this was the center for uh, relocation. It was called Villa Sicania, and it was located in Sicily. What happened was that it became overfull. Very quickly, it became overfull. Um, so then they said, okay, now where are we going to send people for relocation? All right, what we'll do next is we'll create relocation hubs. And at relocation hubs, there were supposed to be people who knew about the relocation progress, could assist you in filling out the forms, who had cultural mediators who spoke different languages so that people would be able to um, have the services they need. Nine hubs were set up. Quickly, those hubs became full. So then, what happened to Eritrea and survived when all these centers were full that were supposed to be assisting them with relocation? They were sent into the voluntary national distribution mechanism. So this is a very common policy that countries like the UK have. Um, I think the Netherlands has it as well. Italy has it. And that this is, means basically that you arrive and then you're sent wherever there is room, right? To into the voluntary distribution center. So you can be sent anywhere within the country as an asylum seeker. And the second thing that's important to note that was in, in Italy, of course, we're operating a state of emergency. And with an emergency, there are not enough beds. Italy's first reception system had in 2017 less than 11,000 beds. And it received 170,000 arrivals. So, so, so clearly, they needed to do something to create enough beds. They created an emergency system, which basically meant that people could apply to become a reception center. So if you had an agroturismo or a type of business that was no longer working, you could say, okay, I apply to make it a um, reception center. Reports in Italy have shown that these vary widely in health and safety standards, um, access to information and treatment of migrants, so, and there's no uh, monitoring of them, so it's very unclear as to how they're being managed. For many people, it's also been reported that they were viewed as a business opportunity, so not as a mechanism to assist migrants that were coming, but as a way to make money from the government for hosting migrants. At the end of 2018, 86% of migrants in Italy were hosted in emergency reception and not within mainstream reception. So again, this shows that there's a lot of variations in terms of what they had access to. So why do I call this a bit of the disarray? Well, because um, the reception system in Italy is influenced by the EU policies, changes to EU policies, which took the country from being one of, it, of um, transit to really one of what they call now containment. People now had to stay in Italy and apply for asylum, so Italy had to house all of these people on short notice. Um, it creates a complex system of multi-level governance, which we see playing out very strongly between the relationships between e Italy and the EU. It created a very stressed system that was still operating in an emergency approach. And um, one of the other things that was really important is that was happening in 2016 and 2017, the EU did reporting on, uh, they do regular uh, reporting on the relocation program, and they were regular reporting back to Italy Eritreans are not registering for relocation. Why are they not reporting back to Eritrea? Why are they not registering for relocation? Less than half of Eritrean arrivals are registering, so what's going on? And that's what we're going to explain now. So what happened to these Eritreans? How did they come to the system that was in the state of crisis and navigate it to try to find and access the relocation program? Just to sort of summarize this one last time, I want to highlight here, these are the number of arrivals to Italy over the years. These were the number of asylum applications in Italy. These are not perfect percentages. They're ones that I've made just by comparing um, asylum applications to arrival, but they still give you a sense of the fact that less than 40% were applying for asylum in 2014, but in 2017, these were much higher. Everyone was because they needed to because of fingerprinting. And particularly with Eritreans. So Eritreans do not want to stay in Italy. For them, Italy is not the destination. They want to be moving onwards in the EU to northern European countries. And we see that very strongly. Then in 2014, 35,000 Eritreans arrived in Italy, and less than 500 of them actually applied for asylum in Italy. So the majority just transited right through. Whereas by 2017, 6,300 had arrived in Italy, and 90% had applied for asylum in Italy. So this is how the changes in the, in the governance structures were really impacting decision making. So um, in terms of the Eritreans, I conducted 34 interviews with migrants between January and June in Rome and Milan in 2017. I also conducted several key stakeholder interviews. 
I use different methodologies for the local context, and I can go into that in more detail later if you are interested. Um, and most of the interviews were recorded and transcribed for analysis. So what were the results that I found with the Eritreans? I'm going to talk about them in uh, terms of five points. So the first we'll talk about their disembarkation and fingerprinting, their experiences in first reception and accessing relocation, drivers of secondary movement within Italy, changing the initial decision to relocation, and then we'll move to talking about secondary movers reception in Milan and how Milan became a changing site. So um, within my respondents, I've just put here as an example to give you an idea of one, it was that people first heard about the relocation program. And you can see that the majority of people first heard about the relocation program at disembarkation. Um, some people were missed at disembarkation and they learned about it later on while in Italy here. And a small one in five had actually heard about it prior to arrival. Um, so we're going to talk about first these people here with disembarkation. So at disembarkation, um, what happened is that when you arrive at the hotspots, when you, when you disembark to go to a hotspot, the majority of the time there's a cultural mediator on site. Most often they speak Tigrina, sometimes they only speak English, and their job is of course to communicate with the new arrivals and to tell them what's happening and to inform them about the relocation program. Eritreans know about fingerprinting, and so many of them, their first response uh, at disembarkation is to run, is to run away and to try to evade fingerprinting so that they can transit through the country undetected. Um, but the point then, every, uh, the messaging that was, the main point of the messaging at disembarkation was, don't run, it's okay, there's a legal way for you to go, it's called relocation, and we can help you go to northern Italy, you don't need to run away. And I think that what was actually really striking is that in the people I spoke to in interviews, um, some people did manage to run away, and they came back because of this messaging. They came back because they said, okay, we trust you, there's a legal opportunity, so we come back and now we'll be fingerprinted and now we'll try for the legal way versus going through irregularly. Once they had disembarked, um, they were sent to different sites of first reception. And like I said, most of the people that I interviewed were not sent to hubs or were not sent to the center for relocation. They arrived in uh, late 2016 to 2017, where situations were very, where the situation was very full, and they were entered into the national redistribu redistribution program for asylum seekers. So some of them were in very small towns in places that they did not even know the name of, um, and they couldn't tell me exactly where they had been. Um, but they arrived there. There was very often no cultural mediator, so they could not communicate because they didn't speak the language. There was no translators. And they said they wanted to apply for relocation, and they were told to go to Castura. And there was a variety of situations that would then happen to them at Castura. Um, and the form for relocation, I should also mention, it's the same form as you would uh, fill out to apply for asylum. You just tick a different box. So if you want to be an asylum seeker, it's one box. If you want to apply for relocation, you tick a different box. So for people that didn't necessarily know this, and it was also quite confusing then looking at the form, um, and they would say, we want to go for relocation, we have family, we want to reunify, reunite with them. They were told, no problem, no problem, here, sign the form, okay, off you go. And they would wait for three to four months, and three to four months later, their papers would come with their permit to stay in Italy, and they would say, no, 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 this isn't what we wanted, we wanted to apply for relocation, and they said, no, we don't know what you're talking about. So um, there was a lot of problems in the sense that um, other people would go to Castor and say we want to apply for relocation and they would say we don't have that program here. We, we don't have relocation, we just offer asylum. And it was also to the point that um, some Eritreans, they would be sent to um, centers and they would, the, the, literally they did not sleep a night in those centers because the a manager of the center would come out and say, look, I recognize you're probably here for relocation, it's not offered here, so I suggest you go on to Milan and in Milan they can help you. And they would give them money and send them on the bus and tell them to go. So there, there was recognition and there was not recognition, depending on where they were sent, about access to relocation and what was happening. Because of these problems, of course, people started recognizing that this isn't working and trying to move onwards. It is against the law to move on in Italy from the place where you were initially assigned for 
the asylum system, right? So if you're assigned to a certain center, you're supposed to stay there, you are not supposed to leave there. That is, that is breaking the, the rules. Um, and so what we start to see is, of course, this internal secondary movement because people were not able to access the program. And the main reasons that they started to engage in this secondary movement is one, um, the time, the duration of time that it took to not receive relocation. They were told at the beginning, and the process is always supposed to be, that within three to six months of arrival, people would be relocated. Timelines generally took much longer than this, often 12 to 18 months for relocations to actually occur. And within this process, there was often very little information about what was happening with their process or their case. They didn't know if it was happening or not. Um, so people started getting very frustrated with time, and they started moving onwards. And this is a very common finding, I think, that has been, you know, Melanie Griffith, for example, has really shown this well, the question of time and lost time during the asylum process. A second key reason was because of the experience at the Questura. They were unclear if they had applied for relocation or not, or they thought they had applied, or the person was not being very clear with them, so they often didn't know what was happening, and this created a lot of anxiety as to whether or not they were going to get the relocation or not. And finally, um, for those of you who may have done research before with Eritreans, they're a heavily networked group, so most of the respondents I spoke to had family or friends in other northern European countries, some who had already come through Italy and come through the relocation program, or other people that they arrived with that had moved onward, so they were regularly in contact and speaking with them. And um, often they received advice from family and friends that no, you should not be staying, you should be continuing on from where you are. So many people changed the decision, and most commonly they went to Milan or Rome. And when they went to um, Milan, they arrived at a center that was called the Hub. It was located just outside of Milan Central train station, and it was the point at which for um, a long time in Milan where they used to help migrants transiting, but now it had become a place where if you arrived in Milan as a secondary mover, you could ask to get your case changed to be located in Milan. And when I was there in April, they were allowing for that. So they were allowing for people to have their cases changed to wherever they were assigned to come and have it in Milan. And once they were registered, then they could then be sent to a new asylum center in Milan. And in Milan, they were very, um, the staff all knew about the relocation program and were able to assist people in dealing with their paperwork and dealing with all the problems that they were experiencing to get registered into the relocation program. But another interesting thing happened in Milan, the people that also arrived, planning to transit through Italy, planning to move onwards, changed their decisions when they came to the hub. And the reason for this is that when they arrived at the center, they started to have interaction with Dublin returnees. So all new arrivals in Milan come to the center first, and this includes people who have been Dublin returned. And then when they had interaction with Dublin returnees, so people who had been returned from moving onwards in um, Europe, they understood about the consequences of going onwards irregularly, and they saw that firsthand, and they got better advice, and they changed their minds to then apply for the relocation program. And this is quite unique because we don't have many centers that operate in this way, but it really quite clearly shows that these types of interactions can also change decision making. And um, I just want to, coming closer to the end now, while I was in Milan, the situation in Milan though started to really change. Um, and this center that I'm mentioning, the hub, um, it was a center that was started in uh, 2013 to 2014. They estimate that it assisted over 100,000 refugees that traveled through Milan, mostly going northward over this three year period. But in 2017, when I was there, the caseload had completely changed. It was no longer people transiting through the city. It was now people that were transferring to become and stay in the city and needed a bed in the city. So Milan was now taking on a much higher proportion of arrivals than what it was allocated within the National Redistribution Program because all these people were moving irregularly, secondarily to the city. And because of this, there was very long wait times in the city. It was creating additional burden. Um, there was a lot of complaints from the local population that why are we having to, you know, take on this additional burden as well, so there's not enough beds. Um, there was a very high-profile case of a suicide of a migrant who committed suicide right outside of the hub by the train tracks, and the city decided, okay, enough is enough and we need to change here. And what they did is they did not in any way change policies, they just changed how they enforce policies. 
And what this means is that they started to say, no, we are not going to accept, accept any more secondary movers from within Italy. So we're going to change our policy that if you arrive here, we will say, no, you, we cannot take your case. You have to go back to where you came from. And the result of which was um, for quite some time an increase of people living on the streets in Milan when they arrived. There was no support when they arrived. And when they went to Castura to ask if they could change their case, they were told, no, you have to go back the way you came. Um, so people were really then stranded um, without being again able to access the relocation program. And as this was just happening in May, when I, um, I went with my translator to try and interview some people who were in this situation, and they were really lost because they said, you know, we just want to access the relocation program. We could not access it where we were. They told us they didn't have it. And now we're here. They will again not let us access it. And we don't know what to do. I don't have the money to go back to where I came. Um, I don't know if I can try here. I want to enter the program. But maybe it's best that I just continue on irregularly and go to France. So people were really having a hard time in accessing it and this changing space that was really catching people that were not able to access it in first reception was also transferred. So coming to the conclusions of the presentation, what, what can we um, conclude from the different environment? First of all, it's very clear that there's changing multi-level governance has a significant impact on Italy um, and at different levels at, from the national to the local level. It went from a country that was offering as a site of transit to one of containment due to the EU policies and the implementation of the hotspot approach. We see that Milan is essentially acting as a microcosm within Italy, um, which I think was really interesting in that it was the core city of transit that then became a core city of containment that had to take on this extra load. And then as a result, basically said, okay, we have to implement now because we're so over capacity, we have to implement now basically an, an Italian Dublin regulation where you are sent back again to where you came within Italy. Um, and this is, I think, really interesting to see this sort of evolve how this, these changes occurred. For Eritreans, um, it's important to reflect that for them, Italy was never the destination. Um, when they learned about relocation, they had a very strong preference for it because it was an opportunity, of course, for a legal way to migrate onwards. Um, they were very active in using their networks to identify discrepancies within the system and to make decisions. So when they were in centers where they were not receiving the right services, they were on the phone trying to get help and saying, what should I do and where should I go? And at that time, the core advice they received was, you need to go to Milan and you need to get help. And they engaged then in these secondary movements as first really showing that it was an act against jurisdictional incompetencies. So really, every single prefetura should have known about the, uh, the relocation program, and they should have been able to apply at any one of those prefeturas across the countries. But that wasn't happening. So there was a lot of um, inconsistencies that were happening, and that was a key reason why they were seeking to move on. They were engaging these secondary movements as resistance to waiting and lost time and not being able to get services and support, and also as resistance to marginalization. So, um, I mean, keeping in mind that some of these centers were located in rural areas outside of towns where people had to walk two hours down a mountain to get to the nearest town. So some people were heavily marginalized in the places that they were sent to. And also for Eritreans, because of their language capacities are very specific, uh, if they were in centers without any other Eritreans, they felt very marginalized because they weren't able to communicate because they didn't have the language capacity. So for them, also being in centers with other Eritreans was a me uh, method of social networks and support that made them feel less marginalized. Coming back to the relocation program, um, this has been heavily regarded as a failure in the EU. There are several reasons for this. I mean, one is, of course, the court cases that came out from Hungary. Um, against the EU and the EU uh, regarding the relocation program. Another reason was that uh, member states did not pledge the number of uh, spots that were expected in the relocation program. The 160,000 spots were never fully pledged. Um, a third reason is that it was, uh, took much longer than it should have in processing. So requests were made to Northern European countries. Those requests were not answered or those requests were refused. So it took a very long time to actually move people through the system. And of course, the final numbers, as I showed at the beginning, are far less than what was expected, right? So um, there's a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's regarded as a failure. But at the same time, I think that it's also really important to 
Remember that it was the very positive effects that it did have for some of those who are eligible. Eritreans were very, very happy to have this opportunity and to receive the opportunity for the relocation program. It increased their willingness for fingerprinting at arrival, which is really um, an important area for the EU. It reduced their decisions for irregular secondary movements. They voluntarily decided to apply for the relocation program as a legal option to migrate onwards than going onwards irregularly. And I was able to follow up in my study with um, about 12 of the families that had then received relocation after the, um, being in Italy. And they were all very satisfied with what they were experiencing. Within the relocation program, I tried as much as possible to match people to family ties. So if you had an aunt or a brother or someone in Germany, they would try to send you to Germany as well. So many of them were relocated with family. And they were very also um, satisfied and happy about this opportunity. So for the people that did actually go through it, there are a lot of positive elements that I think are important to remember. Um, and coming then to the final conclusion, the Italian reception system has really been influenced by complex multi-level governance goals. So um, when I speak to scholars in Italy, what has happened with the EU has been a massive debate for the Italian migration scholars because they very strongly um, feel that Italy has had to give up its autonomy in how it manages migration and asylum to the EU through the hotspot approach. So there's been a lot of contestation of this. Um, Secondly, the information was provided to Eritreans at several points in time. And we see this, right? We see this, that there's a lot of information provided at disembarkation. There's new information provided at um, first reception and as they go through the process. But it was still very high levels of confusion and standards varied greatly. So depending on where they went makes a tremendous difference in the types of services and support they receive and the ability they have to then see their applications through and achieve their goals. Um, and finally, it's important to reflect that asylum seekers are constantly evaluating and trying to understand their situation within the system, and it's a system of moving parts. So what we really saw in the final part where I was trying to discuss the changing situation of the city of Milan is that what people went to Milan expecting was no longer the case, because very quickly the city made a change in how it enforced the policy, and it changed, right? So the advice they got two weeks ago was no longer relevant. And policies and implementation, it can have a very quick impact on people, and it resulted in them having to be living on the streets and considering now irregular migration onwards to countries like France versus staying where they were and, and accessing the relocation program. So understanding the dynamics here between the decision making and the governance and how they're interrelated is quite important for the EU and future planning of these types of programs and their goals. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you.